The following is a special presentation of Untold, Stories of a World War II Liberator, written by Deborah Levine and directed by Dennis Parker, with music composed and performed by Michael Levine. The voices of these stories are tenderly brought to life by Deborah Levine, Dylan Koosman, Joel Scribner, Charlene Hong-White, Trish Ross, Chase Parker, George Hochter, and Greg Glover. And now, Untold by Deborah Levine. The Oklahoma City bombing happened while I was scripting a Holocaust education video in Illinois. Motivated by this domestic terrorism, I joined the Tulsa Jewish Federation and became its community relations director. My story begins with the Oklahoma FBI training to secure our campus from neo-Nazi attacks and helping Holocaust survivors telling their stories on TV. The survivors had never spoken of their World War II experience, even to their own families. Stunned, I called my dad in Cincinnati who said, well, I never told you my stories either. And hearing about the FBI, he announced, I'll be there tomorrow. My father, Aaron Levine, was born into an immigrant Jewish family from the Poland-Ukraine area. He pursued the American dream, graduated from Harvard University, married his college sweetheart, Estelle, and ran department stores. He was silent about being a U.S. military intelligence officer during World War II. But in Tulsa, Dad finally talked about interrogating Nazi prisoners of war, liberating a death camp, and how he'd saved his wartime letters in a file cabinet hidden in his closet. I'll share the letters with you along with those of a Polish Holocaust survivor, because eyewitness accounts preserve the truth of what happened. But first, let's start at the beginning with my parents' roots, because as unlikely as it may seem, future historians are within us all. At age four, I was in kindergarten, and suddenly it was decided I should be in the first grade. And there I was with Miss Fish, who had a bad habit of pulling my hair while I was trying to learn the alphabet. I was about a year younger than most of the other kids and stayed that way through high school. Small, skinny, with an inferiority complex. I was co-manager of the varsity football team, an editor of the school paper, won the poetry prize, and entered the honor society. Then I flunked a college board exam and remained in high school for another year. I thought it was tragic, but actually grew up some. Belonged to a new group of friends, got all A's, and was accepted to Harvard. My cup runneth over. Dad moved on from the disappointment of early years, but the cause went deep into his psyche and never completely went away. As first-generation American-born, the immigrant roots were close, twisted, and often painful. I have pondered for years how to assess my relationship with my father. My years of fear and guilt, remorse and regret, love and hate. When I was about 22 or 23, I first learned of my grandfather's suicide on arriving in America and realized that for the first time, something of what had made him what he was. Bitter and resentful towards women in general and his mother in particular. Resentful and contentious, especially towards those more successful than he, formidably authoritative as if it were criminal to ignore him, demanding, moody, hysterical if the conditions appropriate, and it did not take much. Dad hoped to escape the family tensions by being what he called a real American boy, and growing up, I never heard him speak the Yiddish of his immigrant roots. At Harvard, he studied American history and literature. But his father insisted on attending Harvard classes with him, occasionally arguing with the professors. My Aunt Selma, Dad's older sister, took pity on him and introduced him to Estelle, a soft-spoken Bermuda Island girl 
whose diplomatic skills were epic. My report card in kindergarten at the Bermuda High School for Girls was signed by the school's headmistress, Dr. Hallett. She describes my conduct as good on the whole, but inclined to be obstreperous and talkative. I figured out how to work the system because there was never again a negative word on my report cards. Instead, I was promoted to a leadership role and commended for my behavior. My favorite comment was, Estelle's quiet manner is an asset to her as captain. She is, at all times, courteous and willing. Bermuda was not only a base for the American Navy and Air Force, but also a British colony that heard news about the war in Europe before most Americans did. The island was a backdrop to the romance that blossomed between my parents. My mother's parents hosted the Jewish military personnel, as my mother's younger sister, Polly, wrote in her teenage diary about the growing preparations for war. Another rainy Saturday, I spent an hour at Daddy's office watching the Navy launches coming and going. Soldiers and sailors all around, a convoy out at dockyard and target practice. Some of those officers are so cute. The blackouts are getting much better. I can't seem to think of it as anything more than an exciting idea. Every program on the radio tonight has asked people to buy defense bonds. We can't do that here, only certificates, but I am going to knit for the Red Cross. Polly's zest for life was not dimmed by the anti-Semitism that was sweeping the globe and Bermuda, according to the documents preserved in the Bermuda archives. The island was a major tourist destination for Americans, with 70% of tourists during the Christmas holidays being Jewish. The Trade Development Board debated how to address the, quote, Jew trade as the American military prepared for war. Mail today. Mother got 10. It was wonderful. Cousin Elliot wants to join the Aviation Corps. That's what I would do if I were a man. Thumbs up. We all went to St. George's for the soccer game. What fun. Everything there was really exciting in a dull sort of way. Soldiers and sailors all around a convoy out at dockyard, and target practice. Bermuda is only about 24 square miles. But when it became a military hub, British leaders arrived in person to rally the troops. They rallied the whole island, which at the time did not even allow cars for private citizens. I saw Winston Churchill. Imagine, little me, I've never been so excited in all my life. He spoke at the House of Parliament, and I was right there at the gate. You could hear them cheering at his speech right down in the street. He had on his black bowler and was waving it away. Daddy was in there and heard him speak. They sang God Save the King at the end of his speech, and the whole crowd waiting outside stood at attention. I'll never forget that as long as I live. Thumbs up. V for victory. My grandparents were horrified at the stories of Nazi destruction, and especially the murder of Jews in the cities the Nazis invaded. But that didn't stop them from worrying about Estelle, who wanted to go steady at the young age of 17. Dad had fallen in love with her at first sight on campus, and was a very determined suitor. Gramp wanted her to meet more young men before settling on one. Daddy dear, I really am glad that you wrote to me because I have been wanting to write to you about Aaron for a long time, but didn't know how to start or what to say. I want to be absolutely frank with you. You are perfectly right about how I feel towards him. I am certainly very attached to him dependent upon his companionship, and I prefer to be with him than with anybody else. I have felt that way for a long time, since the middle of last year, but have fought against it and tried not to admit it, even to myself. I realize that we're both fundamentally very serious, and if we were going to see each other at all, 
it might lead to something serious. So at the end of last year, I told him I didn't want to see him anymore. Mom knew that she'd put her parents, particularly her father, in an awkward position. She drove home the point in case they still had doubts. For about six months, I wouldn't see him, and I was perfectly miserable. I have tried for the longest time to force myself to go out with other boys, but I just can't do it anymore. It is not a matter of going against your wishes, dear, because you know that I want to do what you would like me to do if I possibly could. I know that what you want is for me to be happy. And here's where Mom gently clinched the deal. Years later, Dad asked Gramp what he thought when he got her letter. Gramp laughingly said that he didn't have a choice. I later made her name into a verb because Gramp had been estelled. I feel so much better now that I have told all of this to you. I hope that you understand. I really think that you will. Both youth and lack of money are things that can be overcome. The really important thing is that the boys should have a good character. Please write and tell me that you approve. It is so difficult to know what to do. I can't give up, Aaron, but I certainly don't want to go against your wishes. War is truly hell, and Bermuda's strategic position demonstrated that no one is safe. Blackouts and bombing raids were commonplace. Food was so scarce it had to be severely rationed. Finally, the danger was too much, and Polly was evacuated. Today was the fatal day, leaving for school in the States. Mom, Daddy, and I went down to the airways office where Dad left us, and we met Joe and Mary. Then in the launch to Daryl's Island, where we found out the plane hadn't arrived from Lisbon and had to wait until 7 o'clock. It was very interesting, though. Bombers, naval scout planes, and trainers all around the place, and Scotty's guarding everything. The plane was loaded to capacity, 65. We were blacked out almost all the way over, but everyone peaked. When Dad graduated, Harvard's 1940 commencement address was given by Secretary of State Tennessean Cordell Hull. War hadn't been declared yet, and Dad would go on to study for his master's degree in American literature. He planned to become a university professor, but that was not to be. His father was deeply disappointed, but Dad, always a realist, saw the growing threat of war much as did Hull. There are at work in the world today powerful forces, the significance of which no individual and no nation can ignore without jeopardy. They rose on many occasions in the past and, for varying periods and with varying intensity, held sway over human affairs. They spring today from the source from which they have always sprung in the past, from godless and soulless lust for power which seeks to hold men in physical slavery and spiritual degradation, and to displace a system of peaceful and ordinary relations among nations by the anarchy of wanton violence and brute force. No more vital test has ever confronted the American people than that which confronts it today. Dad kept the press release of Hull's speech knowing it was history in the making. He also kept the commencement speech from Estelle's graduation the next year, when the United States was only a few months away from entering the war. That commencement speech was given by Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. My grandmother made us laugh for decades, describing how she mistakenly called him Mr. Hamburger to his face. Frankfurter was a Jewish immigrant from Austria who understood better than most what was at stake. College commencements have become a national occasion to celebrate and fortify the national spirit. In the recent past, this great event in the lives of young men and women was a symbol of hope and youth. 
Generations mingled to take heart, one with another to promote the promises that lay ahead. But never before, I believe, have college commitments been so appropriate to the times, nor so symbolic of all that we hold dear. For events compel us to reconsider the significance of our history. Circumstances which even the most ostrich-like can no longer disregard, challenge the worth of our past, the validity of the faith that founded this nation, and our power to vindicate it. Dad expected to be drafted, but was too skinny to qualify, so the couple struggled at jobs on the home front. Dad tried his hand at sales, failing spectacularly as a door-to-door salesman for Hoover Vacuums. Mom got fired as a receptionist. She joked about messing up and her boss yelling, Who's the idiot at the switchboard? Still, Dad tried to be hopeful. Remember, things are never as bad as they seem. And with a little ingenuity and lots of courage, we'll be all right. Everything will be okay. So, don't worry, dear. People in far worse positions than ourselves, what with war and normal troubles, are finding things really fine. At least they're smiling. Forgive the gooey passage and don't worry about the uncertainty. After all, consistency might be boring. Aaron embarked on a rigorous diet of bananas and milkshakes. And though still skinny, he finally achieved the required military weight. He enlisted in the Army, and we both headed out to boot camp in Battle Creek, Michigan, where we rented an old, musty attic. Aaron began training for the military police and could only visit me twice a week. Meanwhile, I sneeze nonstop except for an occasional gig as a substitute teacher. Until one memorable night, when everything changed. There was a sudden call from headquarters to report to Camp Ritchie. Captain Cameron, Harvard Business School grad and very supportive, said that I was to regard my transfer as a secret. That night, I whispered to Estelle, We're getting the hell out of here. And the next day, I was on a Pullman train to Maryland. Little did I know that I would just miss a class and spend the next month cleaning classrooms from midnight to 7 a.m., but it was better than the garbage detail with garbage up to one's knees. My campmates say... I'm the kind of guy that falls into the toilet and comes up with a gold watch. It was almost a month later when Fort Ritchie gave Aaron permission to bring Estelle. She arrived at a nearby town full of love and pregnant. Their first night back together wasn't quite what they expected. The sergeant in charge of my detail didn't want to give me a pass since I'd been up since midnight cleaning classrooms, but I guess he saw the desperation in my eyes. I took the bus and dropped into Estelle's arms in our hotel room. The phone rang, and the hotel manager wanted to know if I had a woman in my room. You're damn right, and she's my wife. I ran downstairs with murder in my eyes and my marriage certificate in my hand and straightened him out. Camp Ritchie was a secret military intelligence training camp that recruited Jewish young men whose families had fled Nazi Germany. They knew the psychology and the language of the enemy better than anyone else. Dad shared that he tried to tell the Camp Ritchie commanders that he was more fluent in French than in German like these young men. He was precise in his analysis. We kids experienced that part of his personality from day one. But if the officers agreed with his analysis, they didn't care and put both his French and German to work. We received a good deal of training in dealing with French people. There were many women with French backgrounds who tested our resourcefulness and reported back to the commanders as to whether we knew what we were doing. Evidently, I passed, but I knew their French was a lot better than mine. Camp Ritchie also trained the recruits on intelligence gathering and psychological warfare. Classes started and consisted of order of battle, interrogation and interpretation techniques, photo interpretation, and plenty of field work, pigeons, radio, and telegraph. There were lectures on military information and a tough two-day field exercise problem which I managed to survive. I can only imagine how emotional it was when it came time to ship out. Dad took a train from Camp Ritchie to New York and traveled by boat to Europe. 
Mom, pregnant and alone, tried to get another train and see Dad off in New York. But Dad's ship left early, and they missed each other. Estelle, dearest, I feel so guilty that I built up the prospect of our seeing each other. Although it's T.S. in the extreme, we do have a great future ahead of us, and that's worth going through anything. I am making a war bond allotment, and with my pay, you'll get $100 per month plus twelve fifty per month in war bonds. If you ever need anything of any sort, from advice to money, don't hesitate to ask the Army Emergency Relief and the Red Cross. Darling, I miss you terribly. Write me voluminously, and I shall write you every day, honey. This is not a farewell letter. Dad began his military intelligence assignment in England. He would have been part of the 24,000 Allied assault troops landing at Normandy in France, but had an accident. I sometimes wonder if it was divine intervention that delayed his deployment, given the tens of thousands of casualties at Normandy. But Dad, as usual, put it down to sheer luck and a bit of stupidity. A funny thing happened on the way to the Normandy invasion. I was a driver for the commanding officers in England, and returning very late one night, drove my jeep into a ditch. I broke my arm along with a few other injuries that landed me in the hospital for several months, missing the invasion. Dad was soon sent to France, then Belgium, and Germany. Decades after the war, he took the family to England and France to see where he'd been assigned. Dad was determined that I experienced Europe in preparation for my being a freshman at Harvard. But he refused to enter Germany. The memories were too overpowering. His family had sustained him during the war, and he could not, would not, allow us to suffer those memories so closely. Estelle, dearest. I feel sort of in the mood to write the great love letter, but my God, I'm inadequate. I just can't match my feelings with the proper words. I doubt anyone can, except for a few great poets. Of course, my tastes in literature are positively epicurean, so for lack of better, I recommend Shakespeare, John Donne, and Keats until we're together, darling. And to add the personal touch, may I say, I love you with all my heart, and that without you, I am woefully unhappy. I only want to make a wonderful life for you when I get back, and I will. I will. That's a promise. Many people today think that the Nazi death camps were created during World War II. But the destruction began long before the war. And it's thanks to archives and museums that this historical truth is preserved. The United States Holocaust Museum reports that starting in 1933, Germany established 20,000 camps to imprison millions of victims. These camps were used for a range of purposes, including forced labor camps, transit camps, which served as temporary way stations, and killing centers built primarily or exclusively for mass murder. After Germany's annexation of Austria in March 1938, the Nazis arrested German and Austrian Jews and imprisoned them. Following the German invasion of Poland in September of 1939, the Nazis opened forced labor camps where thousands of prisoners died from exhaustion, starvation, and exposure. As the battlegrounds expanded, Even before the United States entered the war, every major military campaign was reported in Europe. My mom's family was well aware of these catastrophes because they were also reported in Bermuda's Royal Gazette and the Colonist Daily. I can only imagine the response by my grandparents whose families had immigrated from Eastern Europe when reading descriptions like this one by a Reuters news reporter. The liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto by the Germans is being sped up. It is intended to empty the ghetto altogether and close it before the spring. The methods used are most brutal and inhumane. 
A similar extermination of Jews is going on all over Poland. You must rouse the whole world to action. Only 200,000 remain, and they are threatened with annihilation. My grandfather was proud to be one of Bermuda's first licensed realtors. He was passionate about housing American military staff and Jews fleeing England. Fearing that London would suffer the same fate as Paris, many sent their wives and children to the British colony for protection. Many Jews were dragged from their homes. Others were ejected from the hospital. At the Rothschild Hospital, Er Daneker, renowned for his sadism at the Jewish camp at Compain, personally directed the evacuation with a whip in his hands. Among the patients who were thrown out of this hospital was a cancer case that had been operated on 12 hours before. Also a woman beside whose bed the police stood while she was being delivered of a child. 300 suicides were recorded. Jewesses were seen to throw their babies out of sixth floor windows and then jump to death, screaming wildly. Bermuda's newspaper reported a joint ally declaration condemning the atrocities committed on the Jewish people. The report included British Parliament's debate regarding rescue of Jews with the head of the Church of England, who demanded that they go beyond debate. I was disappointed to read that he focused less on rescuing Jews than on the burden of Jewish refugees. Although the Jewish aspect was the most horrible feature, it was only one feature of a much bigger problem. Over 150,000 refugees had been admitted before and during the war, and all have to be fed and cared for. Britain is not self-supporting. Every ounce of food now brought here is brought by the blood and sweat of British sailors. Whatever our wishes, there must be limits to the steps we can take. Days later, Parliament announced an international refugee conference to be held in Bermuda. Despite being the island's most prominent Jew, my grandfather's request to attend was rejected. No Jewish refugees could attend, and little came out of this conference. Something constructive might have resulted if they'd heard from refugees, like Leon Weisband. While hindsight doesn't save lives, it does provide lessons for the present. I was born in the town of Zwolin, Poland in 1919, and my childhood was a good one. My father, Mordechai, was a smart man with a factory in the same building where we lived. We were five children, and my mother was a good, kind woman. Anti-Semitism was very strong in Poland, but we in Zwolin were not too aware of it or concerned with it. We Jews did not have any fears from the Poles, because in Zvolen, the Jews were in the majority. Life in Zvolen in the days of the 1930s was quiet, peaceful, and uneventful. Weisman survived the Holocaust that followed, and we should all be grateful that he recorded what happened as the Nazis destroyed Zvolen. In September 1939, the Germans attacked the Zvolen. This fear was great. The whole town was being bombed by German aircraft. The houses in the town became skeletons. A few days after the bombing stopped, the Jews who had fled to the woods returned. The houses that the Jews had lived in that remained standing now housed two or more families. Our daily lives were filled with much fear. Every morning the Germans would drag people into forced labor. There were many who helped in small ways and who may never be acknowledged publicly. Weisben mentions how lives were saved by such interventions. But he also illustrates how, despite the heroic interventions, the Nazis' drive to exterminate Jews was all-encompassing. At six in the morning, the sirens sounded off as a warning that all Jews should leave their homes and come to the marketplace. There was tumult running from all sides, mothers with infants in their arms, men and women, each with their meager pack of valuables in hand. Everyone running to the marketplace, which was surrounded by a cordon of gendarmes, SS men, and Ukrainians. 
those who could not or did not run fast were shot on the spot. The town looked like a slaughterhouse, bedding, other Jewish household goods, and dead bodies were all intertwined and lying in the streets. The cries and screams were heartbreaking. Dad told us in later years that these massacres proved the existence of evil, as did the events that followed. Jews who were still alive were ordered to clean up the mess. Wagons moved slowly, with arms and legs hanging down, blood still streaming from them. The bodies not dumped along the way ended up buried in one mass grave. The Gestapo chose 100 young men for the workload. A son would recognize the corpse of his father, or a brother would recognize the body of his sister, but we could not cry. Suddenly, from one of the wagons, a gendarme named Kral brought two small children. We did not realize what was happening. He played with the children, then took out his gun and shot them. The murderous voice of the much-hated lieutenant read the declaration of the fate of the remaining Jews. Most of them were lined up and marched off to concentration camps. When I discovered Dad's letter to Estelle about seeing these camps, I understood better why it took a half a century before he could speak about it. The Allies have discovered various concentration camps, my father wrote in a letter to Estelle. Some of them I've been able to see. They are indescribable. Wouldn't have believed them myself. One cannot convey the right smell and the impression made by two to three thousand starved corpses or the inexhaustibly hungry eyes of still alive Jews and Russians, Poles and French. Be sure of one thing. Terror in the Middle Ages was child's play compared to this. I saw G.I. standing around, just staring, unable to express their anger and hatred towards the Nazis, and these were G.I.s normally careless about the civilians around them. None of us will ever forget. When we arrived in the labor camp in Skarzysko in 1942, we were divided into groups and these groups were assigned to munition factories. Life in the camp was hardly bearable, because daily the Germans would remove a few people and shoot them. We never knew who would be next. In 1943, there was a typhus epidemic in the camp. The Germans did not treat those who were afflicted. They shot them. I was one who came down with typhus, but I hid myself during that period, knowing full well if it were discovered I would be shot. For thirteen days I hid in the stable under hay mounds. I ate nothing, but my brother Reuben would sneak sips of water to me occasionally. Every day the Nazis sent sixty, seventy, or eighty people to a nearby camp where they were murdered. To facilitate the, quote, final solution, which was their term for the genocide of the Jews, the Nazis established killing centers in Poland, the country with the largest Jewish population. Many of the prisoners, including Weisband and his brother, were sent to Buchenwald, a huge compound with 130 satellite camps that held almost a quarter of a million prisoners from 30 countries from 1937 to 1945. We rode for three or four days in a closed freight car on a train with about 150 people in the car. We never left. We ate, slept, and did all natural body functions there. The stench was almost unbearable. When we arrived at Buchenwald, we were divided into groups of 50. We were sent to be shaved and showered. Since we had heard stories about the gas chamber lines, we were certain that this was now our fate. 
we got into the showers, which were strong sprays, heavy with chlorine. Our eyes and our skin burned. We were sure this was the end, and most of us said the prayer for the dead. I could not find my brother. Everyone looked alike in the striped uniform that they issued. We were all given numbers. My number was six, seven, five, five, three. Weissband and many others were sent off to satellite camps that manufactured war materials. But by June 1944, the Allies were closing in on the Nazis, who began to retreat, liquidating the camps and leaving no witnesses. In March 1945, the Germans moved us out of Schlieben because the American army was approaching. My group was moved to Gross Rosen by wagons in the nighttime. It took us three days to get there. At Gross Rosen, the sight was devastating. There were thousands of bodies lined up and piled one on top of the other. We could see some were still barely alive. We noticed an occasional arm or leg move. We were so animal-like in our behavior because of our hunger that we searched the dead and the near dead to see if there might be a hidden piece of bread in the pockets. We only remained in Gross Rosen a few weeks. The Germans were getting desperate because the Americans were approaching from one side and the Russians from the other. The Germans forced march the prisoners from Gross Rosen towards Czechoslovakia. The prisoners walked on bare feet for about three weeks. With almost nothing to eat, many prisoners began to swell from starvation. Some were left to die by the wayside. Others were shot. On May 5th, we arrived in Nixdorf, and the Germans locked us up in the stable. They had decided to set fire to the stable and burn us alive. The mayor of the small town did not want to give his permission for this ultimate act of horror. On May 7th, after dark, the Germans fled and left us there. On May 8th, 1945, the American army arrived and set us free. What a memorable moment that was. Towards the end of the war, Dad described stumbling on Nordhausen. The entrance to Nordhausen was buried under a hill next to a hospital that had a huge red cross painted on it to avoid bombing by the Allies. It was a huge complex without access to sanitation, medical care, or food. Dad described what it was like to open the door to Nordhausen, and I don't think he ever completely recovered. Nordhausen was the scene of concentration camp leftovers. We saw thousands of bodies in one place. The sight and smell are still with me. The gruesome details I'll omit. Suffice it to say that gruesome is a weak word for infants and old folks. These are terrible, disgusting, horrifying. For instance, I'm skinny. But against those starved French and Poles still alive, I am a veritable Charles Atlas, a magnificent specimen. One hardly believes these things until one sees them. I often think of the so-called horrors of war, and the psychological strain is great. I've managed to keep healthy, but deep down, oof. If you've heard of the Battle of the Bulge, you know that it's often called Hitler's last stand. Dad minimized the danger to reassure Estelle. He never did tell her that he and his unit were woken up in the middle of the night and had to run for their lives during this battle. Don't worry, Estelle. During combat, I was personally not in much danger. Once, we were strafed by a plane. We heard the bullet whistles and took off pretty fast. We were harassed from the air several times, a rather terrifying experience. 
We've also been shelled, a disgusting feeling. But most German soldiers I've seen were usually dead ones, or, in the very large majority, prisoners. As the Allies advanced further into Germany, its cities were bombed and its armies dissolved. The destruction in Germany that ended the war was catastrophic. Dad meditated on the ugliness of war and the destruction involved in ending it. He was an expert at seeing consequences, a skill that he later embedded in his children. One thinks a great deal about the German people these days. One sees so many sights that are apt to encourage sympathy. Old people being dispossessed, young kids eyeing you hungrily for a piece of chocolate. One feels sorry for them in a way, but we've come to the point that it is a two-sided feeling. Pity for those, hatred and coldness also for the same people who shouted Heil and invested in Nazism or let themselves be sucked into the net of Nazi crime. While I cannot go out of my way to harm a civilian, I cannot go out of my way to do them a kindness. I remember too well the bodies of Belgian kids murdered by the Germans out of spite and cruelty. I feel sorry for all the innocents, but cannot feel the same for the German who asserts his anti-Nazism while the books of Rosenberg and Goering stand in his bookshelves. In any case... Damn not pleased by the ruins and rubble in Aachen and Duren and other Rhineland towns. Victory was declared in Europe on May 8, 1945. On this VE day, Dad arrived in the city of Leipzig. Some of the censorship rules were relaxed, and Dad's letters became more pointed and detailed. I can now say that I am in Leipzig. We have been in destroyed towns like Aachen, Eschweiler, Duren, Cologne, and in preserved ones like Marburg in Hesse and Eisleben in Saxony and Halt. We spent some time in Aachen, of which you have read much in all the newspapers. What I have read myself in newspapers has not been the whole story by any means, but the pictures of destruction are certainly authentic. The city is rubble. With the official end of the war, Germans of a certain military rank or above were automatically imprisoned, with many going to the Nuremberg trials. Dad's responsibility changed from gathering information about battle plans, in other words, spying, to gathering information that would change Germany's leadership and culture. The military must have known that they had the right man for that job. Dad was charged with discovering who'd been aligned with the Nazi party so that they could be removed from leadership. When I was a kid, I asked him if he'd killed anyone in the war. He said, no, but I slapped someone once. What? The Nazi said he wished Hitler had killed more Jews. Estelle, dear, I know you have questions about my work now that the war is over. Let's just say that I'm doing what we were trained to do at Camp Ritchie, and more. Trying to keep sane while interrogating these Nazis, Dad turned to his first love, books. Reading helped him process the past, present, and future. And books lined every room in our house growing up. I am overwhelming myself with Randall's Making of the Modern Mind altogether very stimulating and helpful. And I admire anyone who can sum up the intellectual attitude of a whole generation or an age without becoming either oversimplified or totally off the beam. As it is, one can notice, unless I'm imagining it, that historians do much better with the ancient past than they do with the recent past. One is set and ossified, and other is still with us and we can't shake it off still fluid and influenced by the present. But at least I shall be able to get a clearer picture of what the present is all about, and having worked so close to it, a perspective is just what I need. As wartime censorship faded, Dad's letters became heartbreaking and incredibly revealing. 
Tragedy is written all over the face of Europe, and it is sickening to see. Sure, you can take the small, mean, vengeful Nazi who beat up Jews and burned churches and make him cringe, punish him, and try and drive him into a sense of guilt and a realization of the crimes to which he was a partner. The rebellious Catholics and Jews once living in this region are now rotting in concentration camps. Who is guilty of all this? Only Hitler and company? What about men and women who now say they were forced to join the party, but made comfortable livings while the rest of Europe starved? As Dad continued his interrogations of Nazis, he tried to make sense of what had happened in Germany, a country once known for its cultural and scientific advancements. I'm gradually getting an idea of the problems in Germany. A large part of the population never belonged to the Nazi party, but 99.9% blame Hitler only for losing the war and seem to suffer no pangs of conscience over the origins of the war or the ideology of the party. They know they are beaten. It's just a risk they took and they lost. They have no questions over the misery they brought to millions of French and English, Poles and Russians. They hardly consider them as humans or that they started the war. Years of maleducation kept them ignorant and proud, selfish and egoistic, claiming that Germany alone has suffered. What does one do with such people? Ruthless handling of party bigwigs and small terrorizers? Complete re-education of the rest? What a job. But there will be hell to pay again if it isn't done. Estelle wrote letters to Dad every day. Knowing my mom, she would do everything she could to support her loved one. I received the money order, darling, and am depositing it into Joey's account. If you really can't use it there, then of course Joey's bank account is an excellent place for it. Honestly, I wish you would keep more money for yourself, sweetheart, and save it in case you should get a furlough. Aren't you due for a leave, pass, furlough, or something by now? Surely you need a break and change, a chance to rest and relax and get out of Germany for a while. And they ought to do something about it. Shall I write to General Eisenhower? Overwhelmed by the interrogations of those who had fallen prey to Nazi propaganda, Dad applauded those who rejected the party line. These were the people who would take the leadership roles vacated by the party followers. The stories of German cruelty and oppression are not just stories. They're the real thing. And much of this was done by what we call ordinary people. Not just the party members, but a vast number of common citizens who fell easy prey to the baloney of National Socialism. People who were jealous griped, depraved, and plain scared. A damn few seemed to have the courage to laugh in Adolf's face. I have met some of them and have only admiration for them because they fought in spite of everything and know on what side they stand and they have always stood. Dad was blunt in predicting the ongoing suffering of the Jewish people. It doesn't make a tinker's damn whether you are religious or a Zionist or like to eat bacon but it is the truth that but for the grace of God or something, we would be in a concentration camp if we had lived, which I doubt. In my own work, I have talked to dozens of former concentration camp prisoners and also SS guards. Conditions for Jews, above all, were indescribable. And death and torture... These words may sound peculiar to you, but after what I have seen and heard, I have a fairly clear idea of what they mean. Were a matter of course. And the reign of terror continues. The fate of the region's Jewish survivors truly worried my dad. What would happen to them after liberation? What kind of life would they have? Many survivors were herded together temporarily in camps. Being a realist, Dad was deeply skeptical about their fate. Out of millions of Jews formerly in Europe, there are now thousands wiped out by means which are almost impossible to believe. 
kids, old women, you name it, in Bavaria now. From all the concentration camps here, there may be altogether some 55,000. And they are living like animals. That much I know. I have seen them. What with United Nations relief and rehabilitation and Red Cross and God knows what else, you might think that the problem is being well taken care of. But it isn't. In the first place, there isn't any place for these people to go. Germany is just a cemetery for them. England and America and France seem to be out of the question. Palestine is about the only place, but you know what the story is there. There are still massacres going on in democratic Poland even now. The damn thing is absolutely ridiculous, to put it at its mildest. Dad wrote to all his family and asked them to buy packages of food and clothing for the survivors. Frustrated and angry, he told them not to donate money to these charities because of the delay and confusion over distribution. As far as I know, not a damn thing is being done about it. A lot of red tape and committees and offices. But right here and now, these people, after five to six years in Buchenwald and company, are starving, sleeping on the floor in lack of clothes, etc., 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 with the German POWs being treated like gentlemen in good hospitals. It comes down to this. The Jews here belong to no state. They can't go home to Poland or Hungary because it means certain death. I really mean this, and no one seems to care. The only people who will care for the Jews are the Jews themselves. Dad was so upset that he used his own paychecks to purchase supplies and mail them. And he was shocked that many Germans denied the truth of what happened, calling it propaganda. I have talked to enough Germans in the past months to fill a good-sized section of Milwaukee. And all types. Army generals and SA bums, a.k.a. stormtroopers in brown shirts. Miners and artists. Professors and pimps. Solid farmers and crafty businessmen. Children, octogenarians, whores, and spies. Confront them with the truth and they cannot believe it. A German army doctor told me that he had been in Russia for a year and never once heard of any German atrocities. Oh, yes, they hung a few people one night and forgot to cut down the bodies for a few days, but everything else was propaganda. He also told me that some of his best friends were Jews. But one night they all disappeared, and he never did get around to inquiring about what had happened to them. Anxious about Aaron's state of mind, Mom wrote to him every day to keep him from depression. She shared my brother Joey's smiles, Bermuda's social events, her latest shopping trip, anything to distract him with normalcy. The term post-traumatic stress syndrome was not invented until 1980, but she didn't need medical training to see that Dad's crusade was driving him into the ground. I want to see a complete re-education. A short talk with a boy from Hitler Youth would provide a very clear example. A conversation with a Nazi teacher who claims Germany's right to enter Czechoslovakia because of 15th century tradition would be another illustration. Well, we can remove the Nazis, make an attempt for re-education, which, incidentally, we had better succeed. But... We have to get deeper also to the cause of this war and the cause of Nazism. Why did this arrive here in Germany? And what were its causes? I don't know now, but I am certainly going to try to find out. Mom urged him to take the long view, to keep things in perspective, for her sake and his. She had pioneered special education for children at risk at Harvard. And I suspect that she was applying what she learned to Dad. Write me as much as you can, sweetheart, about how things are with you. Is it very bad? Is it terribly uncomfortable? Do you work awfully hard? God damn this awful war, anyhow. I suppose the worst part is the loneliness... Lack of recreation, seeing so much destruction, feeling of 
unfriendliness, to put it mildly, all around you. Aaron, darling, I love you very much, and I can't bear that you should be unhappy. Soon, it will be all over, just like a bad dream, and then you begin to feel nostalgic about when you were in Paris and England and tell everyone about your adventures. Dad wanted a post-war career that would financially support his family and considered working for the State Department in Europe. But he had doubts that our government agencies were capable of the massive re-education he considered vital for any permanent cultural shift. Part of me regrets that he didn't take this path, but I do appreciate his skepticism. I have had about enough of this type of work. I would like to get out into something on a broader scale where I can see what is going on generally. Berlin would probably be the proper place for that, but as yet, there's no news in that direction, and it doesn't look promising. Now with things getting near the end, I am thinking, or trying to think, of the concrete future, that is, what to do. There is a large field in civil service, but unless it were something damn good, I wouldn't be interested. The State Department would be terrific, but you know how unreliable these things are. And the same goes for War Department jobs, for which, as a matter of fact, I would be well qualified. But I don't have a lot of faith in these possibilities. In retirement, Aaron Levine became Chief Financial Officer of the American Jewish Archives, where his letters are now preserved. He had a passion for preserving historic truth. I caught that passion when Holocaust denier David Irving told a Tulsa crowd that Hitler actually admired the Jewish people and wasn't responsible for the Holocaust. Irving held up a letter as proof, saying it was written by Hitler himself, but in an ancient German language that only Irving knew. Shocked when the crowd smiled and nodded, I dedicated myself to carry on Dad's work. And when he died years later, I wrote this poem in his honor and read it aloud over his grave. For those who put themselves in harm's way for their families, friends, and country, for those whose lives were taken in war-torn lands far from home, and for all those who carry the wounds of war proudly, and with honor. Let us say a prayer of thanks and remembrance of courage and of valor. To watch the destruction of civilization and hear the cries of the oppressed is to know that good people cannot remain silent or deny commandments from above. As peaceful as this field of headstones, as beautiful as the bouquets that mark your grave, so may be the rest you've earned so well. Your life touched our hearts with the stories that it tells.